Welcome to the online service from Johns Creek Presbyterian Church. Friends, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and let us be glad in it. We are glad that you have tuned in to watch our service this morning. I want to remind you that every Sunday morning at 9.30, we're having our drive-in worship service in our parking lot. We encourage you to come and try that out. If you haven't yet, you can stay in your car safely. You don't have to wear a mask. You can listen to it on the FM radio. There are details on our website. We encourage you to look at that, but we encourage you also to join us in our drive-in service. There are also resources there for children's worship. If you click the icon there, you and your family can enjoy some wonderful uh, resources geared for children and for families, so we encourage you to do that as well. Uh, we invite you to continue to help support the ministry of Johns Creek Presbyterian Church through your financial giving. There's a Pledge Now button on the website. You can click it at any time during the service and give in that way. You can mail a check into the church office. The uh, address of the church is at the end of the video, or you can do it online. So we encourage you to do that, or you can even drop it by the Welcome Center outside the church. But thank you for your generous support. We continue to finish up our uh, Faith in Action stewardship season. So far, we are at 85% of our pledge goal. Thank you to everyone uh, if you have already done that. But if you haven't, we really need you to help us out so we can finish up and do God's work in 2021. There's a Pledge Now button on our website. You can scan a QR code on the pledge card, hopefully that you received in the mail, or you can uh, mail in your request. But we encourage you to do that to help support what we're doing in 2021. The other thing I want to remind you of is that we're having a Blessing of the Animals service on a Sunday evening at 6 p.m. here in the church. You bring your animals with you in the car so you can stay safely in your car. There'll be a drive-through part of that. So we encourage you to be a part of that that Sunday evening at 6 p.m. Friends, those are all of our announcements. Let us now prepare our hearts for the worship of God would you join with me in our call to worship? We gather to affirm that we are all united in God's sacred family. We are each different and unique, yet we are one as children of God. We gather to affirm that we are called to love, serve, and encourage one another. We learn by Jesus' example to love our neighbor in all that we do. We gather to affirm that each of us has gifts to offer. We are members of the one body, each blessed with gifts for God's service. Let us celebrate and worship as a family of God.
As the song reminds us, they'll know we are Christians by our love and not by our perfection. And so when we gather together to show God that we continue to desire a relationship and that we need God to restore the relationships we've broken, we take time to pray a prayer of confession together so that we can ask God to forgive us and help us to remain on the path together. Let us go to our prayer of confession together. God, we are people with such potential. You have given us the ability to speak and to listen, to serve and to share, to laugh and to cry. You ask that we take what we have and use it to your glory, inviting us to do all that we do in a way that is pleasing to you. Forgive us, O oh God, for creating more places to complain than to give thanks, for spending more time examining the mistakes of each other instead of the giftedness in one another. Forgive us for taking so much for granted and for allowing so many of our gifts to lay idle instead of being used. Help us to serve you more faithfully. Show us how to encourage one another. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we can take encouragement in this, that when we turn from our sins and toward the path God calls us to be on, we find God running to us with open arms, ready to embrace us and encourage us all we need. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God.
Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of 1 Thessalonians, the fifth chapter. As we read, we trust that the Spirit will be with us to help us understand. Listen for God's word to you. Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you. For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness, so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all children of the light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So last week, we talked about the second coming of Christ, when Christ will return. We read from Paul's letter to the early church. We said that, first of all, no one knows when that second coming will take place, not even Jesus himself. So speculation about when that will happen simply doesn't make a lot of sense. But in the meantime, Paul urged those in the early church to live as if Jesus were coming back soon. That means loving one another because God has first loved us and God has showed us how to love each other through Jesus. Today's passage is from that same letter that we read last week, and the themes sound the same. A few years back, I went on sabbatical, and I reached out to a number of individuals I hoped to meet with and to talk face to face. I ended up actually meeting with uh, Barbara Brown Taylor, who is the author. She now lives in North Georgia. Uh, Old Testament scholar Walter Brueggemann, who lives in Ohio. Uh, former preaching professor Tom Long, who lives on the Maryland Eastern Shore, and Eugene Peterson, who is a Presbyterian minister, a retired professor, lives in Montana, and author of many books, including the Message Translation of the Bible. In retrospect, I think the, the main reason I wanted to reach out to them can be summed up in one word, <laughs> encouragement encouragement. Not only was I looking for encouragement, but I actually wanted to thank each of them for what they had meant to me over the years, and I wanted to encourage them. Eugene Peterson died not too long after I visited with him, and after his death, many wrote about how significant uh, he had been in their lives. One person put it this way, Years later, Eugene befriended me. He'd recently retired to Montana. I was a young, aspiring pastor, and he took me on, inviting me into a mentoring relationship through letters, conversations, books, and pilgrimages to Flathead Lake. This invitation changed my life and my ministry. Eugene gave me a vision and a language for who I could be as a pastor. He restored honor and dignity to the calling of the pastor. Eugene revived a vision of a pastor as someone serious, intelligent, savvy, creative, playful, and prophetic. Eugene encouraged those in ministry to resist the seductive sirens of the pragmatic pastor in favor of a ministry animated by the patient and cruciform witness of a long obedience in the same direction. Now, each of the individuals I visited had encouraged me, 
but each encouraged in his or her own way, which I think is the nature of encouragement. For example, when we think of encouragers, my guess is that most of us probably think, first of all, of somebody who's like a cheerleader, uh, who constantly seems to be able to affirm almost everyone he or she meets. Dr. Tom Toole, who is preached here uh, for the dedication of our new buildings, who has led our men's retreat, Tom is one of the best encouragers uh, I have ever met, and he encourages in this way. I don't know if that's his personality, if he's always been that way, or his upbringing, or is it something he just learned along the way, but Tom is a great encourager. But that's not the only way to encourage. I think some of us encourage by being a, t a teacher or a mentor like Eugene Peterson, somebody who not only gives positive enforcement, but who is able to challenge us in ways that also encourage us. A few years ago, I remember watching on TV the, the championship game of the Final Four. It was the year that Louisville won it all. After the game, they were all standing there on the podium receiving their trophy when the announcer on the podium asked Peyton Siva, the star Louisville point guard, about what all this meant to him. And the first words out of his mouth were about thanking his Savior, Jesus Christ. When I heard those words from one of sports' newest stars, I was reminded of what one of the announcers had said earlier in the game about why Siva wore number three on his basketball uniform. It was because of his Christian faith in God the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the Trinity. And that's why he wears number three on his jersey. So I went back and I looked more closely at Siva's life. There was a USA Today article about Siva, and it tells about Siva growing up in Seattle. Uh, his mother divorced his father when Siva was only six months old because of his father's many problems. His mom enrolled in college, often bringing Siva along with her to class, which not everybody appreciated, but it was all she could do. Siva got her, Siva's mom got her degree, and Siva says that she is the biggest role model in his life. As he grew up, he started playing basketball. Um, he knew he did not want to go the way of, of drugs and addiction in prison that some of the other members of his family had followed. So along the way, he came across Danny Cage. Danny Cage was the youth pastor that Siva credits for his spiritual life. Cage reached out to Siva, and now they are so close that Siva gets a daily message, a text message, and a Bible verse from his former youth pastor. During their time together, Siva asked Cage to come to one of his games. Um, after the game, Cage, he asked Cage, well, how did I play? And this was a game in which Siva had scored 35 points with bunches of rebounds and assists. Cage said, you really didn't play too well. Siva asked why. And Cage talked about his attitude and the faces Siva made when the referee made a call that would go against him, how it uh, affected Siva for a while. And he he told Siva that as the point guard, he was the leader of the team and that when he had those breakdowns, it actually affected the whole team. He said to Siva, everybody can praise you for basketball, but my job will to help be to help you develop as a man. His coach, Rick Patina, called Siva one of the top three players he has ever coached in college or the pros. But when it comes to encouragers for Siva, it would probably be Jesus first, then his mom, and then his youth pastor, Danny Cage. Sometimes encouragers help us to grow by teaching us what we need to work on. But sometimes we don't need someone to tell us what we need to work on. Mainly, we just need someone to be there with us on the journey, maybe even listening more than speaking. Bill Bowling is the founder and the director of the Atlanta Food Bank. A number of years ago, a number of us pastors were talking with him, and he told us the story about a young woman who had come to his office in a downtown church where he was working at the time for some help. 
He had bus tokens to give her. Um, he had arranged for the woman and her kids to live in a hotel room for a while. He had even talked with her about getting a job. But at one point, the woman pulled up a chair. She sat right across him in his desk. She pointed a finger at him and said, you don't get it, do you? And Bill said he was confused because he was helping her in every way he knew how. It was then that she said this, what I need is someone to be with me and not just give me things. Bill said he will never forget it because he realized part of his job was not just to give people things but to be with them. Sometimes the best way to encourage someone is simply to be with them on the journey of faith. Whatever way we encourage one another, when we do that well, God is using us to encourage others in the same way that God has encouraged us. And when we are present there for others in this way, then we represent and incarnate Christ to others. God uses our voice and our actions to encourage others. A while back, a pastor named Mark Thompson suffered some terrible knife wounds from an assailant in his home. One of the many consequences of his difficult recovery was that he was forced to miss watching his son Chris run in the state cross-country championship meet. So Thompson commissioned his brother Merv to go in his stead. And according to an article in the paper, Mark told his brother, I can't be there to see Chris run, so I want you to be there at the beginning of the race. Holler a lot. Then at the end, I want you to really cheer loudly, and I want you to make your voice sound like mine. Merv heeded the advice. Chris ran a strong race. He finished second. Merv, who's also a pastor, though, discerned a, a theological truth in that story. He said, that's what Jesus wants us to do, to make your voice sound like mine. Friends, I think that's what happens when we encounter encouragers they make their voices and their lives sound and look like Jesus. And it helps us run and finish our race of faith. While this is something that often takes place intentionally on our part, to be encouragers the best way we know how, sometimes God uses us to encourage others even when we don't realize we're doing it. We're just living each day of our lives the way that Jesus taught us to, and yet God can always use what we say or do to build up and encourage others, as Paul talked about at the end of the letter that we just read this morning. A few years ago, I went with a youth group from another church to Montreat, North Carolina for the youth conference. It was a great week. Uh, Roger Nishioka was the preacher, and Roger uh, was a great preacher that week. Uh, at the time, he was a seminary professor and probably the expert on youth ministry in the mainline church. Uh, he's spoken here at our church a few times. He's one of my favorite preachers. One night, he preached on a passage from 1 Samuel, and he told the story of a member of his church, uh, Roger's church, when he was growing up. Roger is Japanese-American, and his father was the pastor of their Presbyterian church. All of the Japanese churches played in a volleyball league, he said. The Presbyterians, the Methodists, the Baptists, even the Buddhists. Roger said that in spite of what you might think, the Buddhists were really mean volleyball players. And they were good. Everybody wanted to beat the Buddhists. He said it was kind of like your faith was on the line or something. But Roger's church had four volleyball teams. Three of them were really bad and one was really good. Their hope to beat the Buddhists lay with the church's really good volleyball team. During one, of, one game, one of their players, a 44-year-old orthodontist, an elder in the church, he went up to spike the ball uh, against the Buddhist. Um, Roger's dad really liked this guy because Roger's dad called him a yes elder. <laughs> His dad said that God had blessed him with 12 elders. There were 10 no elders and two yes elders. And then when his dad would propose some new idea, the elders would vote no, 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 yes, yes. 
and this elder was one of the yes elders. He said his dad prayed for more yes elders, but he got what God gave him. Well, the volleyball player, a yes elder, uh, he went up to spike the ball, and he came down and had a heart attack and, and died. He was 44. He was married and had three young children. This elder's death really shook up the church. He was the first member of Roger's dad's generation to die. Six days after his death, they had the service there at the church. It was packed, and Roger's dad had a hard time getting through the service because he really liked this man. The tradition of the Asian community was for everybody to come up front at the end of the service to, pray, to pay respects for the person who had died. It was an open casket. Right before this happened, Marilyn, who was the widow of the man who died, came up and stood in front of them holding the kids' hands, her kids' hands. She thanked everyone for coming, but then she said there was a song. It was a praise song her husband had heard on the radio recently that he liked, and she thought it would be great if everyone could sing it. And so she began lining out the song. And if I had, <clears throat> if I had a good voice, I would sing it for you. But the lyrics of the song went something like this. <clears throat> How lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, good news. Announcing peace, proclaiming news of happiness. Our God reigns, our God reigns. It's from Isaiah. Roger said he was 17 years old and he was sitting in the back of the pew watching this. After she sang the song, he found himself thinking, Lady, you're a widow. Your husband died six days ago. You have three young kids. How do you have the audacity to stand in front of everyone here and sing, Our God Reigns? Roger said he'd been through confirmation, vacation Bible school. He was a preacher's kid. He was there every Sunday. He was often the first to come and the last to go, which he often resented. But when he saw Marilyn, this widow, standing there, he remembered clearly, thinking to himself, that he didn't have the faith of that widow standing up there and that he was going to spend his whole life trying to get it. All because Marilyn stood up and sang, Our God reigns. Roger said that from time to time he goes back to his father's church. Marilyn still attends. He always finds her, and she asks if Roger has finished his doctorate yet, and he said that he has. She asks if he's still teaching at that school, and he said, yes, Marilyn. And then she says, we are so proud of you. And Roger says that he follows her around the church, and he says, Marilyn, you know why I'm doing this, don't you? And she says, oh, Roger, we are so proud of you. And he follows her some more, and she says, he says to Marilyn, Marilyn, you know why I'm doing this, don't you? And she says, oh, we are so proud of you. Roger says, Marilyn, I'm doing this because of that service. You stood up and sang, Our God Reigns. That's why I'm doing this. Marilyn says, we are so proud of you. And Roger says, I'm proud of you too, Marilyn. Friends, that's what encouragement looks like. It's how we build up one another in Christ. So may God use each one of us to encourage others in our own unique way. In the strong name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Would you join with me in prayer? Gracious God, we thank you that you first encouraged us Help us to encourage one another in the name of Christ. We pray this in his strong name. Amen. One of our greatest encouragements in the faith is that not only are we not alone, that God is with us, that God sends God's spirit, and that that God walked among us, but that we have a tradition of other believers who have gone before us and that surround us as a cloud of witnesses. And we have all been able to stand in the faith and proclaim that faith together. And so we take a moment in our worship service to proclaim that faith to the, the people that are around us, to the community that is around us in our world. Let us go to God 
and say what we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Likewise, we have the opportunity and the privilege and the responsibility to pray for one another in God's world and in our community of faith in our nation. Let us go to God in prayer. Lord, we gather this day to hear your word and remember your promises. This week we remember and give thanks that our cloud of witnesses include men and women who have served in branches of our armed services and their families who have sacrificed so much. We hope to be encouragement to them. We are grateful that you give men and women brave hearts and servant spirits to protect the freedoms that you give us and all of those who are vulnerable. We are indeed thankful. Your word to us today reminds us that we don't know the hour of your coming, but we do know that you love us and you will come. And your spirit is with us until that hour, so we might gather and serve in your name, bravely, boldly, and humbly. Help us to be a challenge to others only when needed, and only in a spirit that's willing to help to facilitate facilitate change or work. Similarly, strengthen us to encourage people with equal sincerity to share burdens and joys with full enthusiasm. And Lord, send us to people to encourage and then help them to encourage us with a spirit of openness, not just to their kindness, but their truth that helps us to grow and change and follow you more nearly. When we encounter those who need encouragement, Make our voices sound like yours, using your good words. And likewise, listening for your encouragement from others and ignoring anything that is discouraging. Make our feet lovely as we deliver good news of your grace, how you reign with love and mercy, that we are cherished as your chosen ones, even in the midst of grief. Give us the strength of widows who sing in their pain and prophets who walk in power, Praying the prayer that your Son taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Blessed be the Lord. 
Friends, God calls each one of us to encourage each other, to build each other up. Each one of us has our own way of doing that, our own set of gifts. We don't have to do it the same way. In fact, God has put you here on earth and created you to encourage others in your own unique way. Remember that God is always there to encourage you and me so that we can continue on in this life that he has given us. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. 